in this particular sutta, the Buddha talks about different kinds of sensations or felt experiences. And he compares also two different kinds of happiness, the worldly kind of happiness and the happiness that comes from mental development, which delineates clearly his teaching and his path and what we are practicing on this retreat. The Buddha, when the Buddha talks about the world, slowly we're starting to implement a few elements of his wisdom and what the Buddha called the world, loka was only these six senses. And so to understand the Buddha's teaching and when the Buddha talks about the world, he is talking about the six senses because the world is literally these six senses. So slowly we will start understanding a few things about these things. And here, this is a conversation between uh, the carpenter Panchakanga and the Venerable Udai. And this is how it begins. This sutta is number 59, I believe. 59, the plurality of felt experiences in the middle length discourses. Thus have I heard on the one once the awakened one was living at Savati, in Jetta's grove at Anatapindika's monastery. At that time, the carpenter Panjaganga went to visit the elder Udai. He approached, paid loving respects, and sat down beside him. The carpenter Panjaganga was known to be a very uh, devout and uh, follower of the Buddha and when I say this, I mean simply someone who was really, really uh, invested and very um, keen in following this teaching. Uh, he was a very, uh, he was supporting the Sangha and the Buddha. So he was fairly, he was fairly wise and um, he was con uh, very frequently uh, visiting the monks and so uh, he was fairly knowledgeable about the teaching. Then the carpenter Panchakanga asked the elder Udai, Bhante, how many sensations, how many kinds of sensations are explained by the awakened one? The awakened one explained three kinds of sensations, carpenter. Pleasant sensation, unpleasant sensations, and neutral sensations. These are the three kinds of sensations explained by the awakened one. When this was said, Panchakanga replied, but Bhante Udai, the teacher did not speak about three kinds of sensations. He only spoke about two, pleasant and unpleasant. Now we're, we might be wondering why he was asking the question if he knew the answer. <laughs> But for sometimes we ask questions because we know, but we want clarification. So I believe that's probably what he meant. <laughs> not, pro not just arguing with <laughs> some monk. <laughs> Dante, the awakened one said that these neutral sensations are our delightful happiness, partaking of peace. And here we have this word upeka. This neutral, what I call the neutral uh, sensations here is this uh, neither pleasant nor unpleasant. This is the actual Pali literal translation. But in other suttas, the Buddha talks about this equanimity that comes from uh, sometimes he talked about these sensations, these neutral sensations, as equanimity. But equanimity can be twofold, and that's why equanimity sometimes is tricky. <laughs> we think we are aware, but uh, 
<laughs> so we need a good foundation to practice equanimity quite properly. And equanimity can be this equanimity that I explained in, I believe it was last talk, that comes from mental development, from uplifting the mind through joy, letting go, samadhi, the seven supports of awakening that culminate as the seventh support of awakening, which is upeka, equanimity. But equanimity can also be about material things, the equanimity of the world. And this is, in our language, this is called indifference. <laughs> when we get um, overloaded, oversaturated with all of these things of the world, we become numb. We become uh, completely, awareness is dull completely. And that's the other equanimity, which we would call more indifference or dullness of mind. So here, that is the difference. For a second time and for a third time, the elder Udai said the same to Panchakanga. But Bhante Udai, the teacher, did not speak about three kinds of sensations, and so on. Never could the elder Udai's explanation be received by Panchakanga. Nor could Panchakanga's explanation be received by the elder Udai. Overhearing this friendly discussion between the elder Udai and the carpenter, the elder Ananda went to the awakened one, sat down beside him and reported this discussion and informed the awakened one. The statement, and the Buddha replied, the statement of the elder Udai, which Panchakanga would not accept, was true. And the statement of Panchakanga, which the elder Udai would not accept, was also true. Ananda, I spoke of two kinds of sensations in one exposition. I spoke of three kinds of sensations in another. I spoke of five kinds of sensations in another one. I spoke of six kinds of sensations in yet another. I spoke of eighteen kinds of sensations in yet another. I spoke of thirty-six kinds of sensations in another. And I spoke of a hundred and eight kinds of sensations in yet another. And this is talking about an exposition where he talks about each of the sense doors, the six, six sense doors, the eye, the ear, the nose, uh, the tongue, the body, and the mind. And he talks about each of these feelings, three feelings per sense doors, pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral. So that starts to make a lot of, <laughs> and based on uh, also uh, mental development and then based on the world. So it starts to uh, exponentially go up. But he had this way of explaining things in many different ways. So this is a sutta that I also like to talk about because it also, the Buddha teaches us directly to keep an open mind about his teaching and to keep things open and flexible because he did teach things in different ways <laughs> and it's not worth it to, we shouldn't uh, argue about it. We should try to understand. I have taught Dhamma in all of these different ways, Ananda. And though I have taught Dhamma in all of these different ways, even if it was well spoken and clearly expressed each time, it is to be expected that some will not approve, some will not concede, some will not appreciate. These people will be living at strife, disputing and arguing, continually attacking each other with words like swords. 
I have taught the Dhamma in all of these different ways, Ananda. When the Dhamma has been taught by me in all of these different ways, well spoken, clearly expressed each time, it is to be expected that some will approve, some will concede, some will appreciate. These people will be living in unity, in mutual joy, without dispute, blending together like milk and water, continually looking upon another with caring eyes. Ananda, there are these five kinds of sensory desires. What five? Forms perceived by the eye which are desired and loved, seductive and enticing, mingled with desire and exciting. Sounds perceived by the ear which are desired and loved, seductive and enticing, mingled with desire and exciting. Odors perceived by the nose which are desired and loved, seductive and enticing, mingled with desire and exciting. Flavors perceived by the tongue which are desired and loved, seductive and enticing, mingled with desire and exciting. Tangibles perceived by the body which are desired and loved, seductive and enticing, mingled with desire and exciting. These are the five kinds of sensory desires, Ananda. Ananda, the, the happiness and delight that arises rooted upon these five kinds of sensory desires this is called the happiness of desires. Ananda, those who say this is the highest peace, happiness, and delight that can be experienced, I do not agree with them. Why is that? Because, Ananda, there is another kind of happiness beyond this and more exalted. Now here the Buddha talks, this is where we uh, differentiate these two kinds of happiness. And this, what we just mentioned, everybody gets to experience that. We are born in this world and we have the five senses. And since the day we were born, this is what we grew up in. And we have been more or less, but more, more than less, looking for happiness into these five senses. But sometimes there is this thing that happens and we might stumble upon something we call Dhamma. And According to whatever actions we've done in the past, this is all karma. There's no coincidence, really. We might get to realize some things about these five uh, kinds of pleasures and happiness. And the Buddha gave very wonderful similes, very wonderful analogies to explain a little bit the, where, where these where this kind of happiness leads and the danger in them. And why am I saying this to you? <laughs> well, this is part of the Vinaya Samukasa that I recited to you on this puja. This is one of the things that the Buddha explained very often with this, this path that we saw yesterday. So we've been developing our mind, cultivating it, uplifting it slowly. We've built awareness a little bit more. And so these few days, and then we've heard this path that the Buddha taught. 
and the, when he delivered his uh, his explanation of his path, he also within it he also explained the danger in seeking happiness into this, into all of these ways that we could find happiness in the, the five senses. And this does not mean don't ever, <laughs> don't have fun <laughs> or anything. That's not what it means. But this is simply out of compassion. And that's the, what the Buddha had because out of compassion, he said that to the, to the people. Because this is, this is the danger. Now, there are many levels to this. <laughs> and of course, some, some, to some level, it's quite blameless. Some of them are quite, it's quite blameless. But also, I felt like sharing this now because we are in a very wonderful time that shows us this quite clearly where we have this pandemic happening and there's this big lockdown and we are uh, removed from all of these things that we're used to to do and to enjoy and to get together all good do all these things but if that is the that is quite a beautiful example of the danger in this kind of thing that doesn't mean that we should all uh we should never uh, go out and see other people or anything <laughs> that's not what i mean but that in fact uh we see it with uh we do not just talk about a pandemic right now, we talk also about mental health for a lot of people. And uh, the problem with mental health like this is that people are looking for happiness in these kinds of things. Whereas these things, when they are taken away, then happiness is taken away. And this can be taken away at any time. Nobody knew when COVID started that it was going to start and that it was going to change everything, that we were going to be forced to meditate. <laughs> well, actually, some people think it's pretty great. <laughs> so we have this choice. We can actually harness this. We can, we are actually quite fortunate in so many ways. It's not a war. We still have food. We still have so many things. We can still grow to the grocery store. Well, not me, but <laughs> the, um, the life has, life has taken quite a change for sure. But also we can choose to to actually see it in a positive way, to see it as a wonderful way of meditation. Meditating is, uh, this is a wonderful opportunity that we have, a wonderful opportunity to help each other, to do good deeds. And this is the same thing in our meditation. When these obstacles come up, these distractions, Distractions are not something that we fight against. This is not something that we push away. This is not wisdom according to the Buddha. The distractions and obstacles that come up, the anger, the anxiety, the fear, the restlessness in the mind, they are teachers. We, they are showing us what is in fact in our minds. And during this meditation, this is what we're learning to do. We're learning to see them and accept them and let them go and to, to deal with them finally and to send them compassion and treat them in a good way.
in a wholesome way, finally. And this is not something that a lot of people do. This is not, this is not the mainstream happiness. But this kind of happiness is a wonderful investment. And this is where this second kind of happiness, the, the happiness from mental development that the Buddha taught comes in as such a precious gift for us. And what is that other kind of happiness? Here, Ananda, letting go of all sensory engagement, letting go of unwholesome mental states, still attended by thinking and reflection, with the blissful happiness born of letting go. One understands and abides in the first level of meditation. Now, the first level of meditation, the first jhana, if we're practicing with the metta, which I highly recommend at the beginning, this first level of meditation, we notice in, in many ways, in fact, it's, it's not necessarily, it's a bit of an in-between state. So, there is this in Pali, it's vivichewa kamehi, and this is what I call letting go of all sensory engagement. So this is not a clear-cut uh, factor, as you can see. Vivichewa, ewa is quiet, <laughs> so it's fairly vague. <laughs> so we don't want to take a really sharp knife and cut it off and say, no, now I'm in this first jhana, and now I'm not. And so this is a gradual stepping into this realm of mental development, mental upliftment. And as we learn to use, whether you use the six R's, which is simply a, a compound of discernment and right effort together, or you use the four steps of right effort, or for example, you could be even simply using the template of the Four Noble Truths to move, move along in this teaching. Seeing the tension when the distraction arise, the two first Noble Truths, seeing their release, releasing that, and then the fourth Noble Truth, practicing the path, bringing up a wholesome state. And so, there are many people understand in different ways, and the Buddha definitely explained this in many different ways. But as long as we understand the basic, the discernment, when there is a hindrance, it's not about pushing that away, it's not about shutting it off. It's actually about seeing it for what it is, seeing the slight tension that arises in the head, Every time there is this engagement towards a thought, towards a distraction, there is always this tension that arises in the head. Or at the beginning, it can even be in the body. But the more we will go, it will be just a slight contraction. And this letting go of all sensory engagement it doesn't happen all at once. So it's something that we do, and then we bring up the metta, for example, and then we stay for as long as we can with it. And that will, that will show us the way that will clean up the mental slate for a little while. And then things will arise again. And so we continually let go of that. And this is quite... It's, it's quite easy to do to let go of sensory engagement. When we sit down, close our eyes, that's about it. <laughs> Don't mean to make this more complicated, but that's about it. And then it's vivichewa akusalehi dhammehi. What that means is akusalehi akusala. Kusala means wholesome. Akusala means unwholesome or unskillful. 
These are all the distractions. And this is now, this is where uh, it gets a little bit more intricate. The, these are the five hindrances. This is wanting something. Uh, this is um, uh, pushing away something I, I want or I don't want. Or um, restlessness, agitation, or worry. Or doubt, and this is a quite, quite, uh, quite an amazing hindrance. Doubt, because so many people have it. Like, oh, it's not working. But it's quite wonderful to realize that just this thought is actually the hindrance that is keeping you from meditating properly. <laughs> and without going too far into this one, um, these are. In general, there are way more than this. Of course, all of these unwholesome states that come into our mind and become obsessive, compulsive. There are blind reactions. They are these things that pull us away of our awareness. And uh, these un unwholesome states of mind, unskillful, well, we wiche wa, once again, quite detached, quite letting go, quite much of these states. So what does that tell us? Is that this is kind of in between. So we're practicing this. The first jhana, we are in the first jhana, literally, from the beginning when we let go, when we purposefully sit down and we bring up metta, we let go of the distractions. We're basically in that place. We're quite in that place. So, still attended by thinking and reflection, the mind is still coarse. It will be still thinking and reflecting. And this is twofold. We can either use this thinking to be active in our meditation, bringing up a wholesome object, for example, that will bring metta to us. And we can build our awareness and build the feeling because this is a gradual training. It will start to stick the more we practice it. And so this can be an active thing. Or it can also be that the mind is still active and we are simply resting with the metta. There are thoughts, but we are letting them go as we are going about. So this, is, this can be used to our advantage or it can be simply a passive thing that is just the mind is still active there's still that chatter tanisaro bhikkhu calls it the the inner mob <laughs> the inner chatter <laughs> but this there comes a point when the metta it softens that down it, it we we let go enough and then it it calms down. There's not that inner mob always, you know, talking. And so we will, as we practice this, the fourth, the fourth line that describes this first level of meditation is Viveka Jang Piti Sukkang. So this is with the blissful ease or the blissful happiness that comes from viveka, detaching, letting go. And this is the more we do it, the more we experience it. And the metta is kind of a boost. It will, metta has this natural piti to it, this natural joy, this natural upliftment. And it will, that is why one of the many good qualities of metta is that it will bring this aspect even more in our meditation than if we were to, for example, practice uh, one of the satipatthanas for, at the very beginning, which is not impossible. Simply, the metta will give us a bit of a boost. That's why I say it's the highway. The highway to Nibbana. And so we will experience this relief at this Pamoja as we let go of the hindrances like these 
these wonderful uh, analogies that the Buddha gives, like, like uh, being freed from death, being uh, freed from slavery, freed from jail, having come upon a heaven on, on, on earth after having been on a wild desert journey. So this is how it feels to let go of the hindrances. It feels good. The mind feels relieved. And that is, that is the beginning of the happiness of mental development. And we cultivate this. We cultivate this palmoja. We, we, at the beginning, it's important. Of course, near the end, we will see these, these are all uh, impermanent, not self. But we have to begin with building up a strong, healthy foundation so that we can really understand these deeper teachings. That is that other kind of happiness which goes beyond and is more exalted. Ananda, those who say this is the highest peace, happiness and delight that can be experienced, I do not agree with them. Why is that? Because, Ananda, there is another kind of happiness beyond this and more exalted. What is this other kind of happiness? Here, Ananda, with the calming of thinking and reflection, with inner tranquilization, one's mind becoming unified, without thinking and reflection, with the blissful happiness born of mental stillness. Sometimes I call samadhi stillness of mind, sometimes collectedness, collected mental harmony. Um, Stillness has another uh, quite uh, nice flavor to it because uh, it seems to be missing in the collectedness. It's, it's, for me, I see it as both stillness and collectedness. They kind of come together. But here we're talking about this collectedness of mind that is starting to occur, at, interestingly, at the second level of meditation. So at the first level, we didn't have that so much. We were only aware of this relief from letting go and bringing up these wholesome states. But we don't necessarily feel this collectedness right away. Though it is happening here with when calming the thoughts and the imagination in the mind, the inner mob, when it calms down when it stops the chatter, the chatter calms down and these do not, it doesn't happen all at once. It is a slow progress. These jhanas, they're all interconnected. So we are moving from one station to another, but we, we do not, we're not in that station and teleport in the other station. We go through the forest, the meadows, we see all the scenery. <laughs> so we have all kinds of things happening while this is happening. But these are the main stations that we will see along the way, the mark stones. And at this point, the more we let go, the more we bring up these wholesome states and we become steady into these now all the all the thinking and reflection was only wholesome it was never about any anger or judgment or criticizing and then as as we practice this over and over again the mind becomes more steady and the water starts to collect the water of awareness starts to pool in the mind so the waters have reversed now instead of our awareness flowing into the world now the slope is inward. So we are collecting, gathering awareness. And that is samadhi. And at that point, that thinking and reflecting, it calms down. Now the mind becomes quite silent. And there are suttas where the Buddha called this jhana noble silence, in fact. And this is 
what noble silence means is this particular state of meditation. With inner tranquilizi tranquilization, which I just explained, one's bind, mind becoming unified. Without thinking and reflection, with the blissful happiness born of mental stillness or collectedness. And this collectedness has a particular flavor. It is blissful. And so we will learn to, we will learn to follow this. Well, we will slowly understand that this, the more we release and the more we rest, into this samadhi, this collectiveness, the more this feels like liberating, the more this fe feels blissful. And this is not something that we necessarily will be um, holding on and clinging to necessarily. In fact, the beauty of this is that this is how the mind works. And, well, we don't have to think, oh, my mind is becoming happy and blissful and collected. It simply is, because that is Dhamma. That is how the mind works. So it is an impersonal process in the end. But slowly we are starting to realize this. And to begin with, we need to understand and follow this joy, follow this bliss of release because then the meditation becomes very easy we are bound to practice if we are enjoying the practice whereas uh, in some in some meditation techniques some people go to a retreat for example they think oh uh, i will sit this retreat and then i will do meditation and then going home and it's so hard and there's there's not a whole lot of um, there's a lot of sitting through pain for example or things like that and this is hard to maintain a good practice because it's not very encouraging <laughs> but where when there's a lot of goodness and we really do feel the fruits that we do feel changed we do feel like we're uplifted, we're happy, and we're taking, drinking our happiness out of this well of mental development, then it's really very really easy for us to just go back there and to want to meditate. So this needs to be emphasized at the beginning to enjoy the meditation. So at the beginning there is letting go which is blissful and then samadhi is also very blissful and this becomes the new uh, the new experience of happiness through release that is the other kind of happiness which is beyond this and more exalted ananda those who say this is the highest peace happiness and delight that can be experienced I do not agree with them. Why is that? Because, Ananda, there is another kind of happiness beyond this and more exalted. What is this other kind of happiness? Here, Ananda, with the calming of stronger joy, abiding in mental steadiness, present and fully aware, experiencing happiness within one's body, that state which the Aryas describe as steady presence of mind. This is a pleasant abiding. One understands and abides in the third level of meditation. Now at this point, the, the coarser element, and this might uh, revolve back to a question last night about the difference between this state and the next one. Well, this state, the coarser sensation in this state is the stronger joy, or the, in the previous uh, state was the stronger joy, and now it calms down. And see here, it does not disappear. It 
uh, the Pali is um, Vupasama, that, that PT calms down. So it does not disappear, but it changes quality. It is not as strong because the mind is in fact starting to delight more and more in calmer states. And this becomes more blissful, but it's another quality. So this is why I usually start talking about bliss at this point instead of joy as an awakening support. Some people think that there is there's no more joy after this jhana, but that's not true. There are the seven supports of awakening work all the way up to Nibbana. So and joy is the fourth of them. So it calms down, it changes quality, but it still is. There is a sense of goodness. Otherwise we wouldn't be doing it. <laughs> and this is beginning where uh, we're starting to experience very strong steadiness of mind. And that steady awareness, that is the seventh of the supports of awakening. We've seen all the, the seven so far uh, arising. We've had awareness. We need awareness to start any of this. And then investigation of states, which is partly thinking and imagining, but also this is simply the practice, what we do. And we do that continually. That is energy or devotion. And then this culminates into the joy. And that is, that is present since the first jhana. And then we have collectedness or tranquility and then collectedness, which are in the second jhana, mostly explained. And now we have the beginning of upeka, the seventh awakening factor. Of course, they are always working all this whole path they are always working but this is another place where you can find this sequence it's not directly mentioned but here it is and then we have the first step into upeka but we still have this sukha this uh this uh happiness with the body this is that other kind of happiness which is beyond this and more exalted. Ananda, those who say this is the highest peace, happiness and delight that can be experienced. I do not agree with them. Why is that? Because, Ananda, there is another kind of happiness beyond this and more exalted. What is this other kind of happiness? Here, Ananda, unattached to pleasant experiences, unsteered, unstirred by unpleasant ones, as mental excitement and heaviness settle, one's mind is balanced, purified by unmoving presence. One understands and abides in the fourth level of meditation. And at this point, the coarser state, and this is the main ingredient that delineates these two states, is the, the bodily happiness that we feel. So it's at that point in, in the third jhana. That level of excitement is a little bit too coarse for the mind as well. There is still bliss in steadiness of mind. And this is where the mind is going more and more. The bliss of calm. But here at this fourth level, it becomes very, very steady. The metta at this point will be <clears throat> very subtle, very, very easy to maintain. It barely requires any effort and very quickly things will start well not quickly but <laughs> things start to change at this point things things are starting to shift and we will see this in the next one 
Ananda, those who say this is the highest peace, happiness and delight that can be experienced, I do not agree with them. Why is that? Because, Ananda, there is another kind of happiness beyond this and more exalted. What is this other kind of happiness? Here, Ananda, leaving behind all perception of form, this is body. This is what the Buddha called the body very often. It can be other things, but for us right now, it will be body. With the fading away of sensory awareness, turning away from the perception of plurality, aware of endless space, one understands and abides in the, in the plane of endless spaciousness. So what happens here is that these first four levels of meditations, like I said earlier in other discourse, they are called the rupa jhanas, the form, uh, the levels of meditations that we are aware of form, of body still. At this point, now there is a moving away from bodily awareness, slowly towards the mental realms. And the mind does not have a body. Mind is mind. And so when we move towards the mind, we move away from the body because that is simply happening because of strong collectedness of mind. Because the mind becomes very, very wholesome. And as the mind becomes very collected, the body awareness fades away because the mind is very collected. Uh, in some instances, we can even say that uh, some people will experience that the feeling will of metta, for example, sometimes it's explained like that, the feeling of metta will go up into the head, for example, or there will be this feeling of awareness moving, shifting into the head. Well, the way that I explain this is simply that the samadhi, the collectedness of mind, becomes much stronger. And the awareness of body, for the mind, is too heavy, too coarse at that point. It doesn't really want to pay attention to it anymore. The bliss is much more in that newly acquired samadhi that doesn't have this bodily coarse awareness. And so, of course, the body will still be there. It will still, if something happens, there is some wind, you might feel it. Or whatever, you might feel some parts of your body. If, if the mind slips into, back into these, looking at certain parts of the body, or there's something happening, a mosquito or a bug landing on you. But in, in a general way, we are moving away from this slowly. And because mind doesn't have a body, when we first take the step into mind, it feels very spacious. Because there is not that dense thing that we call body. Now it's only mind. And mind is... The way, way, because we're so used to this bodily awareness, when there is the stepping into mind, there is the stepping into vast spaciousness. And that's the first feeling that people will experience. And at this point, the feeling of metta, if we follow the sequence of the Brahma Viharas, the feeling of metta will change. The Buddha, I'm not sure if we will see this particular sutta on this retreat, but there is a sutta where the, the Buddha explains this quite clearly. And he says, the limit of loving kindness or boundless love is the fourth level of meditation. And he says that compassion, um, the limit of compassion boundlessly is uh, the the plane of endless space. So this is what we're talking about. And joy is the next. And 
boundless calm will be the next and we will i will talk about each of them as we go along but here metta you will notice that metta is too coarse of a feeling metta cannot be completely brought into this this uh, realm of spaciousness because we're we're moving away from from this form and this coarser uh, the the this coarser reality it feels a bit more distant and so does the feeling of metta and we notice that and this might not be extremely apparent and this is a very uh, very subtle nuance in this meditation not everybody really uh, sees it very clearly and that's fine there's no problem as long as you maintain this vehicle of uh, wholesomeness of goodwill and then you will see that it will become more distant and that's what we call more compassion we, there is this element of being detached, feeling that goodwill, yet in a more detached way. We're not, we're seeing, seeing this feeling, but not getting it involved with it so much as we were with Metta. And it's getting simpler and simpler as we go. And at this point, we simply stay and we, the, the meditation, you will see in this kind of practice, it becomes more and more effortless. So the, the real trick here is to more and more get out of the way and let go than more than grabbing and trying to make it happen in our own way. So these, these states, they happen as we move away, as we let go and keep practicing this wholesome vehicle of awareness. But the mind, at this point, we're talking about little longer sits, about an hour and a half to two hours. Because the mind, there is no magic. The mind needs time to settle. It needs time to calm down. And they can be experienced faster, but at the beginning, the mind needs time and there's just no real way around it. And that's great. And so on this retreat, this is why I, I have been starting to emphasize to slowly, as you feel comfortable, if you need to sit in a chair, sit in a chair, there's no problem. The position, interestingly, the position really doesn't matter that much, <laughs> to be honest. And the, however you're going to do this, if you have really strong pain, personally, this is how I, ex I explain this at the beginning. If you can move a little bit, or let's say you're sitting cross-legged and you have pain in your knees because it's been an hour, an hour and a half you, you sit. If you open up your legs and you can meditate for another hour, that's great. There's no problem. Of course, if you can find a way that you will go deeper in your meditation, of course, moving the less amount possible is always better because you, you will see as we go, naturally, as the mind becomes more steady, there will not be that inclination to move as much anyways. We will let go of these distractions, disturbances. Of course, this, these sensations they are simply uh, sensations. And there are deeper teachings that can be said about these. But personally, 
how I instruct at the beginning, how I see is that the most important part of this is actually that you can experience the deeper stages of meditation, even if you were to change a little bit your posture, it doesn't matter. And then you will see as we will go, we will implement some things and that will uh, nourish your, the mental steadiness. Of course, this is a general instruction and some, some people, there are other instructions. Uh, some people have a lot of pain in the body and move a lot. And uh, very often these pains, they're not real. They're not physical, they're all mental. Because these sensations, they have their roots in the mind. And very often, though very often, by allowing people to go deeper, these will simply settle by themselves and they will uh, experience relief from these pains and uh, more, more confidence, whereas when there is a strict uh, mandatory stillness in the meditation, some people get agitated and <laughs> arise some, some unwholesome states in them. Because Ananda, there is another kind of happiness beyond this and more exalted. What is this other kind of happiness? Here, Ananda, leaving behind the plane of endless space, aware of endless consciousness, one understands and abides in the plane of endless consciousness. This is that other kind of happiness which is beyond this and more exalted. Now, what is happening in the mind? There was this spaciousness as we step into the realm of the mind. We're leaving this heavy, coarse bodily experience. And the first thing we notice is this expansion or simply vastness. And then the feeling of compassion also becomes too coarse and we will naturally, the mind will want to let go even more and the, the Brahma Viharas that comes after this is joy, because joy is very, very simple. It is very uh, straightforward. There's not much involved. There's not another thing involved. There's just this joy. <laughs> and this radiant joy, in fact, this is the jhana, the level of uh, meditation, but also living where the, the devas of the streaming, streaming radiance uh, live. <laughs> this is how they live. And so this is also a good way to practice in, into this uh, level of meditation. And what happens is that the spaciousness, it, it becomes more stabilized, it becomes more steady and this, un this understanding becomes uh, quite, quite solid. And as, it, as we let go even further, as we release, relax, continue to carry our awareness in the vehicle of joy, now we will start to see that the mind is becoming even more refined and it's starting to see and witness consciousness itself. This is experienced in different ways. Some people experience it as flickering, like frames on a very fast movie. And these, a lot of insights happen at this point where um, we get to see that this mind, what we call this mind, or this awareness, is in fact continually, 
continually arising and passing away, arising and passing away, arising and passing away. And the way that I describe this state is that this word consciousness is this, if we break it down, there's con and shusness. Shusness comes from the Latin sire, which means to know. And con is from also the Latin, which means with. So it is with the knowledge of something, knowledge with something. And we see in that state that there is always an object of our mind. Mind is always coming up with something. <laughs> and it arises and it passes away as soon as it arises. And the thing is that here we, and people experience this in different ways. Some people don't see that flickering and that's fine. Don't make it a big deal. Sometimes it will simply be this insight of mind is constantly just rising, 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 passing away, passing away. Uh, and this is fairly subtle. And uh, once again, not everybody always see that. But a lot of people also understand the transition through the Brahma Viharas. And that can also be uh, um, a direction for them. And so they understand that, yes, the mind is calmed down to a certain level and the compassion feels too coarse and the joy feels more as simple, more open, liberated. And to only follow this. But usually there will be some kind of uh, seeing. We will be starting to see all these uh, these little tiny consciousnesses arising and passing away. And this is a state where we get a wonderful insight on the nature of the mind because there we spend some time and one of the insight that arises first is how is this happening? Who is making this happen? <laughs> And now we are starting to scratch at some deeper understandings of the Buddha's teaching. And we get to see in the first row seats what he meant by anatta, not self, or impersonality. That in fact, this consciousness is just a process that is conditioned. It comes from many, many things. However, we've conditioned our mind in the past, and just so you know, this whole path is mental conditioning, but it is wholesome mental conditioning. And whether we like it or not, we're conditioning our minds all the time with everything that we do. We're creating impressions on our minds with everything that we do. So whether we choose to cultivate wholesome impressions until we reach full awakening, or we choose to uh, the opposite, that is up to us. But whatever the mind has been conditioned with, uh, this is what arises. And uh, at this level, we are starting to see the seeds of our awareness, the seeds of thoughts, the tiny little... We're starting to see the tiny little mental movements. And that's where I change vocabulary the asavas, I stop calling the asavas distractions and I start calling them the mental movements. Because at this point, they're not full-fledged distractions. The mind will not likely be completely ripped out of awareness. But we will start to see this as mental movements. The mind is starting to move towards something. And this is how we get to see this, and this comes with a little bit of tension. Okay, I will try to move along here. <laughs> Ananda, those who say this is the highest peace, happiness, and delight that can be experienced. Uh, 
I do not agree with them. Why is that? Because, Ananda, there is another kind of happiness beyond this and more exalted. What is this other kind of happiness? Here, Ananda, leaving behind the plane of endless consciousness, aware of nothing in particular, one understands and abides in the plane of bare awareness or nothingness. This is that other kind of happiness which is beyond this and more exalted. Now, as I've explained it, there was this con and shisness, so this knowing of. And after this place where we get to see the mind continually arising and it's this very impersonal process. Even if we tell, stop, it's not, <laughs> it's just not, because that's not how it works. It's not you, it's not me, it's impersonal. It's just coming up because it's been conditioned like that. And the more we dissolve this, the more we calm down again and again, and we rest the mind deeper every time. Now we will get to a place where all these cons have been let go of, given up. But there is still this shisness. There is still this knowing. And this is the knowing of knowing. This is awareness of awareness itself. This is Awareness of what? Of nothing much. Nothing in particular. And that's why this called, this jhana is called often the plane of nothingness, which I call bare awareness very often because it has become rid of everything. Now it's like this, these beautiful sand dunes. <laughs> bare, bare sand dunes. There is not, we don't, uh, there is nothing coming up much. There is, there are still things, but there are very subtle. And at this point, we are only, awareness becomes very clear, very clear awareness of not much. And at this, at this level, Joy becomes two course of a vehicle for the mind as a Brahma Vihara. And we will move towards boundless calm or boundless equanimity or boundless steady awareness. And just generating this radiation or this, this radiating or this it happens fairly naturally at this point. We don't need to do much. In fact, the, the less we do, the more, the closer we are to that state. And uh, the intention of putting out this boundless calm is very, very, very gentle, very, very subtle. And so there is very little effort. And see, this whole process is, that's why the Buddha called these jhanas, the vimokas, the gradual liberations. And we are liberating the mind with every single jhana. And so we're moving away. We're stepping out until we're completely stepping out. And... At this level, this is starting to be pretty good. And we realize that this meditation is starting to bear very interesting fruits. And we're starting to get a glimpse at the deeper levels. Ananda, those who say this is the highest peace, happiness and delight that can be experienced. I do not agree with them. Why is that? Because, Ananda, there is another kind of happiness beyond this and more exalted. What is this other kind of happiness? 
Here, Ananda, leaving behind the plane of bare awareness or nothingness, one understands and abides in the plane between awareness and its limit. This is also called neither perception nor non-perception. And this is something that is very popular in Pali and at that time, uh, saying these uh, neither this, neither that. And uh, <laughs> in our contemporary English, it's a bit of a mild mouthful. So um, the plane between awareness and its limit is one way of describing it also that works. And um, this is where some interesting phenomena are starting to happen. We have polished the mirror of awareness so much. It has become so clear and bright with so little, not even movements, very tiny, tiny movements. The beginning of any kind of seeds or uh, the beginning of a beginning thought is, is seen before it arises. And this is what I call the, the movements, the asavas, the mind is starting to shift. And then when we see this, we notice because we start to have awareness sharp enough. And then we will stay in that space for quite a bit in this nothingness and things are so still, so clear, so steady that for some time we will have this impression that awareness itself starts to falter. It starts to seems to disappear. It dissipates for brief moments, but this is very hard to see because how do we know this? How do we know awareness slips out? We don't. <laughs> how do we know when there's no more awareness? Well, we just don't. <laughs> there's no more awareness. How could we know? So, this is when the Buddha starts saying we are only aware of these states when we are back out of them. And there is this Pachavekana possible. Pachavekana we've seen in other talks that I've given. This is the... Uh, Pachavekana means mirror, this reflection, this looking back at our experience. And it, we're not going into big question lines about our experience at this point, but we just know intuitively that when, when awareness starts to uh, dissipate completely because it is so pure and so still, it's like a polished piece of glass that we've polished so much, it seems like it, it's not there anymore we completely see through it. And so this is the same thing that happens at this, uh, at this level, at that time. And the Brahma Viharas cannot be taken further than this. At this point, the, this Samadhi will be the object or mental steadiness will be the object. If we talk about an object, because this is also can be interpreted as the one of the finest or uh, more most advanced way of practicing the satipatthanas and observing mind as mind but it can also be understood as understanding or observing dhamma as dhamma mental states as mental states because in these mental states, there are the seven factors of awakening. And at this point, we're literally simply uh, aware of these, uh, the bal balancing of these factors. And 
too much energy at this point will create uh, will bring the mind out of this state and it will make it coarser it will become a little too coarse for it to be fully aware and uh, letting go even deeper and too much uh, letting go too much too much relaxing might start causing drowsiness because this is a very this is a very fine line and this is where we are learning to tune our awareness as we've seen in other suttas this is where we are learning the right pitch for our work here and slowly as we are becoming used to this state we are slowly starting to get our bearing as much as, we, as is possible in this state we are we will be taking this mind as mind as a vehicle or simply samadhi or these seven factors of awakening becoming ever more sharp they then awareness will more and more we will let be starting to let go of awareness itself and this is a very important aspect of this teaching and practice and in fact not very many people know the next <laughs> stage and this stage also but that the buddha's teaching is not about just awareness awareness is something that happens in the practice through cultivating wholesome states and letting go of unwholesome ones but the real goal is complete liberation and it is liberation from awareness itself and this is quite profound and not many people know this about the Buddhist teaching and it is not being taught uh, in many places but here we are talking about it this is that other kind of happiness which is beyond this and more exalted Ananda, those who say this is the highest peace, happiness and delight that can be experienced, I do not agree with them. Why is that? Because, Ananda, there is another kind of happiness beyond this and more exalted. What is this other kind of happiness? Here, Ananda, leaving behind the plane between awareness and its limit. One understands and abides in the release from perceptual awareness. That is that other kind of happiness which is beyond this and more exalted. And now at this level of meditation, now we've gotten fairly comfortable in uh, the limit of awareness. We, these states are not completely different either. They are very naturally flowing in, into one another and we have been cultivating this complete letting go this complete release from perceptual awareness in the other jhana but now it is uh, becoming uh, fully released fully let go there are still very 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 small dhammas or phenomena arising in mind in neither perception or non-perception the limit of awareness they are barely we can barely uh, perceive them and that is the tricky thing so that is why that in between space <laughs> but when we intuitively at that point if you're using the six r's the six r's are very much automatic they're really happening by themselves it's like the release button is pressed and it's held on. It's, it's stuck. We're just releasing, 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 releasing. Until 
until there is nothing else to release, really, until everything has been released. There is nothing coming up. And we fully trust, we fully plunge, we enter the Dhamma. And this is called Niroda, cessation, or what I, I find cessation a bit, uh, a bit intense for some people sometimes, so I call it release. Uh, this, they're, they're the same, really. And <clears throat> this is also called Nibbana. Nibbana is called uh, many different things, but that is one thing that, is, that can be called Nibbana. And because Nibbana means the putting out, extinguishing, and therefore this is the extinguishing of awareness itself. And quite a profound insight there is that we've been seeing all these little movements and these little tensions. And this a bit of a final insight is that we understand that there is tension in awareness itself. And this is how we move away from it. And this is quite a wonderful key to have because this will uh, show you the way when uh, you need to open the door. And there are m wonderful ways of speaking about this last stage, and uh, some people are very good at it. <laughs> and we will speak... I didn't talk about me, uh, by, by the way. <laughs> that was not about me. Um, we, we will get to speak a little bit more about uh, this, uh, these later stages in another sutta, uh, hopefully on this retreat a little bit further down. And what happens here is that, of course, like I said, how could we be aware when there's no awareness? So that is just impossible. We are only aware when we come out of this. And I, I use the word we, but uh, this is an interesting play on words. A, a person cannot enter this state. In fact, we have to let go of that personhood to enter this state. But um, the only way a person can know that they have experienced this is that awareness will come back up. And when it comes back up, this is how we know it wasn't there. <laughs> so, <laughs> and this is, this is tricky. This is very, very profound. This is very subtle. And very often, especially at the beginning, there will be quite, quite some relief, quite a, a profound sense of having let go of, of something quite big or having understood something quite profound. And <clears throat> we get to, a person gets to experience three kinds of contacts uh, coming out of this state. They're called the voidness contact. So we, there is this understanding of complete voidness. There is this knowing, this understanding that was in fact experienced at that time. Now it's not, it is not a mere theoretical concept. Now it is a an understanding, an experience. And then there's the signless contact, where there was no more, there was uh, no more sign, no more object in the mind. There is nothing to be aware of. And so this is the signless. And there is the undirected contact or unapplied. The mind 
has completely uh, lost any kind of direction. <laughs> there is no more. There is no more a sense of a direction. This was completely opened up, and this there is there was for a moment there was there is this understanding that there was no more direction. There was no more forcing here of the mind. The mind was completely expanded, completely. Uh, there was a going beyond all of this. There are many things to say, but we will move on here. Because of this, Ananda, those... <clears throat> That is that other kind of happiness which is beyond this and more exalted. Because of this ananda, those practitioners of other teachings might ask, the sage Gotama speaks of the end of perceptual awareness and declares it as partaking of happiness. How can this be? How can this be said? And you might even come upon this uh, sometime. When this is asked, Ananda, the wanderers of other teachings should be answered in this way. Friend, the awakened one do not, does not declare only pleasant sensations as partaking of happiness. Friend, in this way, Wherever one goes, happiness is found, whether here or there. This is the truth find this the truth finder declares as true happiness. And this is how this sutta ends, looping back around to the sensations, and that the Buddha's teaching is not merely about finding happiness in different kinds of sensations. It is in fact more and more finding happiness in release, mental development, which have their own sensations moving on towards the end, but the main bliss is in this release, Nibbana. After experiencing this or something like this, the meditation uh, might change a little bit for, for a person who experienced these deeper stages. And the meditation at this point becomes quite effortless. There are still these all these vehicles that we can use. There are still these... Uh, However, we want to keep developing the mind. This is not, this is not full awakening. This is only getting a first dip. <laughs> but <laughs> this was, it's pretty good. And <clears throat> but a, a mind that experiences the Dhamma to such a depth knows the path now. It knows the way, and therefore there is natural, very strong confidence that comes up because there is simply direct experience, direct knowledge. Now, I don't have to tell you. Then that, that's when people come and say, and they talk about it. They explain every step with their own words. They know what, they know because they've experienced it. And so nobody can turn that down. And that's when there is great faith, great confidence that comes from understanding and direct experience in the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. And this kind of person really understands very clearly, there is no more doubt about virtuous behavior. The five, the five virtues become not negotiable. Nobody would, that experiences such profound uh, state would not, would not think it very wise for themselves to try and 
move away from these virtues. They would simply see it as very, very troublesome and very unpleasant. And it is said that a person like this cannot cover up uh, their mistake. If they've broken a virtue, they cannot, they can't lie about it. They can't, they can't cover it up. So, because it's simply the truth of Dhamma is so present that it's, it simply is impossible. It simply is uh, uh, seen as too much restlessness in the mind, and that's just intolerable at this point. <laughs> and therefore, um, there will be more development work uh, to be done with the mind. There will be, there is more bhavana, there is, but the waters have turned now, the waters we've been climbing up and going upstream, and now we're at this tipping point where the water flows the other way towards liberation. A person like this is, um, it is said that they only have seven more lifetimes in samsara, however heedless they are or they become. They only have seven more lifetimes become before they reach full awakening. And this full confidence in the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha because of direct understanding of the Dhamma we know that what the Buddha taught was true because we've experienced it. And we know that the Dhamma is well proclaimed, well taught. And we know that the Sangha is practicing the right way because they're practicing this path that we've just lived. And this virtue that is unshakable. These are four factors that are called the four factors of stream entry. And on this, I will, uh, well, I know it's getting late for some people, so I don't want to be, I wouldn't want to be keeping you too long. But do you have any questions? I've been talking for quite a while. I understand you. <laughs> Good. Yes. Okay, let's share some merits and I'll let you go. Dukkha patta chani dukkha bhaya patta chani bhaya soka patta chani soka hontu sabbe pipani no irang no punyang sabbe satta anumodantu sabba sampatti siddhiya aka satta chabumatta deva naga mahidika punyang tang anumoditva Chirang rakkantu buddha sasasana May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share these merits that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty powers, Share these merits of ours. May they long protect the Buddha Sasana. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. I wish you very wonderful and successful meditation, and I will see you tomorrow.